every minute I'm thinking of Shane and Josh. I close my eyes and I can see them in my mind all the time. I know that they're still in that cell and they don't know when they're gonna get out and they're two beautiful people, two innocent people that don't deserve to be there and should never have been there in the first place. I need you to help me to free Shane and Josh. I was completely devastated. I mean, even when I think about it now, it was like if you can imagine the worst news of your life, that was that that was that piece of news right there. I can't help but wonder are they okay? Are they alive? I mean, that was my biggest fear is are they alive? We don't know when we're going to see them. We don't know when they're released. This was the worst day of my life. Sarah, Shane, and Josh, each individually, are really unique and remarkable people. Shane is an extraordinary photojournalist. He's done work for the nation. For Mother Jones, for New America Media Online, the Christian Science Monitor. He also completed a documentary on Darfur. He's very compassionate, he's very kind. He's made it his life's work to, to try to help people that need help. I'm extremely proud of my son, Shane. I'm a very proud mother of Josh, and <laughs> there's no question here. And I would recommend that people stand around this side. If you build up the back, you need to, you need to taper it in like a pyramid. He was a leader in Aprovecho, the sustainable living community, where he ran the internship program for ecological forestry and organic farming. In the spring semester 2009, he was uh, helping these 30 undergraduate American students study health service in India and then China and then in South Africa. Well, Josh is, is my younger brother and you know, he's somebody who's always thinking about other people. He's somebody who's you know, keenly aware of the interconnected uh, nature of, of all people you know, throughout the world. I've always been in awe of my daughter. I've watched her, you know, through her life uh, do the most remarkable things. She started out doing work with uh, indigenous women in Chiapas, Mexico. When the war broke out in Iraq, she was doing direct action to stop the war. And as soon as she heard about Katrina, uh, she basically jumped in a car, joined, joined a caravan of people that were going to help there. Josh, Shane, and Sarah, these are really global citizens. In 2008, Shane and Sarah moved to Damascus, Syria. Shane wanted to be based in the Middle East to continue his photojournalism. Sarah wanted to teach English. Shane's love um, for the Middle East and his passion for learning about the diverse cultures in the region was something that attracted me to him from the beginning. I found a job teaching in Damascus to Iraqi and Palestinian refugees. It was life transforming in, in so many ways. Palestinians, Syrians, Iraqis became our family and it was one of the best years of my life. Keep going with the moving. Shane and Sarah invited Josh to Damascus. They wanted him to, to see what was going on there. Josh was visiting, and uh, Sean was living with them from the, for the summer. They'd been friends before, of course, but that's how the four of them decided to go together. Shane had just finished a deadline on a story. Sarah had a week off for a vacation. They wanted to find a really beautiful place to go to. Their friends in Damascus told them Iraqi Kurdistan is one of the most beautiful places on earth. You can just go online and see all these, these great tours they have. 
Germans, Europeans of all sorts have flocked into the area. I've traveled with Shane myself. He's a very careful traveler. He doesn't take risks, especially when he's in the company of other people. We were in Salamania for a couple of days. We went to a museum and we were kind of touring around the city. We asked our hotel manager for a good place to go hiking and he recommended Ahmedawa, which is a local tourist site, very popular with Westerners and with local Kurdish families. He had a picture of the, the waterfall on the desk. Sean really wanted to go with us to the waterfall, but he was feeling ill. He had a fever and he just decided to stay in the hotel and he was going to meet us if he felt better the next day at the waterfall. This last email from Sarah, this was on July 29th. So the, you know, the next morning they got on a bus and went to the waterfall. And she said, hey mama, so we're traveling. Actually, we're in northern Iraq. The Kurds in this area have been pro-American since 1991. No single American has been hurt on Kurdish territory, so don't worry. Tonight we're going camping. I miss you and love you tons. Sarah. We arrived at Ahmedawa, the waterfall, by bus. We were really shocked by how many people were there. And there were just like hundreds and hundreds of people. And there were um, small restaurant stands, tea shops, and there were families with blankets spread out that were eating food and singing and playing games and it was just like this really festive, amazing place. The next morning we woke up early. We thought it would be nice to go for a hike and there were several trails. So we asked this friendly tea salesman which trail would be good and he pointed to one and said that was a good trail to take. And we said, are there any problems up there? Is it safe? And he said, oh yeah, yeah, sure, it's safe, no problem. So that's the one we chose. There was no fence, no flag, no indication of a border of any kind. We were on the trail for several hours. We just gotten a call from Sean and he was on his way to the waterfall, so we knew we should head back soon. I looked up and I saw a soldier about 300 meters away from us, and he was holding a big gun, a rifle, and then he was motioning with his arm. He was doing like this for us to go further down the trail. So we kind of looked at each other and we were like, Okay, it's just, you know, an Iraqi soldier. It's not a big deal. We're not doing anything wrong. So we felt we had no choice but to follow his instructions, and we went farther down the trail when we saw another soldier. And this soldier motioned for us to come to him. So we stepped off of the trail and walked towards that soldier. And when he started speaking in Farsi, he said, Iran and pointed to the, the ground where we were standing. And then he pointed to the trail that we had been on and he said, Iraq. So according to that soldier, we did not enter Iran until he gestured for us to come off the trail into Iran. We wanted to turn around and go back and we tried and he wouldn't let us. He led us away from the waterfall um, until we met with a group of other soldiers and they were standing around a small structure like shack. They took our things, they took all of our bags and they looked at our passports and they were like, oh, American. I mean, one of them spoke a little bit of English and he was using his English dictionary and Shane was trying to talk to them in Arabic. We were just telling them, you know, we are from the waterfall and we need to go back to Iraq. I was afraid and we were all afraid. So Shane kept pleading with them and, and he finally convinced them to let him make a phone call. And that was when Shane called Sean and told him what had happened. And that's when Sean immediately called the American Embassy in Baghdad. Um, I received a phone call from the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad on July 31st, 2009. I heard on the other end of the phone, we believe your son has become detained. 
possibly by Iranian authorities. We don't know anymore. We'll get back to you as soon as possible. You know, I just sat down on the ground and started to cry and uh, started to think about how I could get her out. It wasn't until the fourth day that we arrived in Tehran, and even to, up to the last minute before we came to the doors of Evan Prison, they told us we were going to an airport and they were going to put us on a plane and send us back home. And they blindfolded us and they tore us apart and threw us into different cells. And that first night I cried and screamed all night long. That's where I lived for the next month. <laughs> they would do things like have me write pages and pages of what I was doing and my teaching in Damascus and then they would look at it and they would tear it up and throw it in the trash and tell me to write it again. They had looked through all our emails and they had, you know, looked at anything online that I told them about my blog, my Skype account, um, and they didn't find anything. And I mean, it, I think it was it was clear to the people questioning us from the very beginning that we weren't spies. In the second month, um, suddenly, I was pulled out of my cell and I heard Shane and Josh's voices and I was led down the hallway, and they, I saw them, and it was an incredible moment. We just threw our arms around each other, and, and they told us we were getting free. They told us they were taking us to the airport, and really, they put us in a car, and we thought we were going, and they took us, um, you know, two blocks inside the prison complex to another part of the prison, and took us out, and, and blindfolded us, and before we knew it, we were back in our cells, three different cells again. I just completely lost control of myself and sort of got lost in this abyss of, of fear. I was just lying there in bed. I didn't eat. I just wanted to disappear, you know? I just wanted to somehow just check out. And even in that most difficult moment, I, my mind would go back to my mother and I just knew that I had to pick myself up and I had to go on and I had to be strong for her. I mean, I used to sit in my cell and think about all of the other innocent people that were inside cells and that were lost and forgotten. Even though this is something so wrong and senseless and cruel, we can come out of this better people and that we can use the rest of our lives to do something good and constructive and right in the world. And I know that Shane and Josh feel the same way. Shane and Josh shared a cell, and Sarah was alone by herself. The first time they came out of the solitary confinement and were able to share a meal together, the three of them, they had to do it blindfolded. What's the reason for that? So this is the best drawing I could do of my, my cell. It, these are the two doors. As you can see, there's no handle on it because it only opens from the outside and it has a small window with bars and a slot at the bottom. And um, the lights in the room are always on. And um, I would just wrap up some, a shirt around my, my eyes so I could sleep at night. It was about halfway through the third month that we started to see a little bit of each other. Like maybe at first it was a half an hour every two days, and then we begged and pleaded, and it was a half an hour every day. We would sit around the courtyard and we would hold hands and constantly talk about family. That was something we tried to do. Shane was so worried about his sisters. Josh was so worried about his brother. I mean, all you think about is family.